now wait a second it's asking me yes so uh, everybody can see can see the screen right um yes so you know before before i start uh thank you for the invitation the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about my work, my project, what I'm doing. Um, I basically, um, I prepared this presentation, but I want it to be a conversation much more than a presentation. And what I mean by that is, is uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime, ask me any questions, right? So um, I have the slides here and I will be talking about some ideas uh, that you might be familiar with or some ideas that you might not be familiar with. And if you're not familiar with something and you want more information about it, just either raise a hand here or just use the microphone and, uh, and, and stop me, right? It's, it's okay. I, I prefer to have some like interactive conversation, much more than a 40 minute presentation. And then by the end realize that people didn't really follow what I was saying because one small aspect was um, much more important than I realized. So having that said, let's move on with it because uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. So basically, um, the title is Musical Instrument Sound Morphing, but um, I will actually talk more specifically about my project, right? So I have a lot of uh, different affiliations here. Um, let me tell you a little about those. So McGill, obviously you know what it is and Kermit is the center uh, for music technology, basically that uh, has many partner institutions, um, but I'm, I am working here I am at Music Tech at McGill which is part of the Schulich School of Music. And my, um, my project, it's a European project, uh, hence the European flag, is basically um, the host and the beneficiary of the project is the CNRS in France. Um, the PRISM lab is uh, my affiliation there. So let, let me just jump right into it right so i'm going to talk a little bit about the morph project um the motivation for it so talk a little about timbre spaces and musical instruments and then musical instrument timbre and sound form. and once um i have made those connections then uh, if i have enough time i will talk about the sound more toolbox but i, I want to play some sound examples um, so this is a brief overview of the project itself, right? So the title is from Timbre Perception to the Creative Exploration of Musical Instruments Sound Morphing. It's a European project. So this is all age 2020. This is basically the information about the funding scheme, right? What's uh, important here, and uh, uh, I think it might be important because some of you might actually be interested in applying for one of those to uh, work in Europe is that it's a Marie Curie actions uh, project. So this is the MSCA here. It's an individual fellowship, which means that I have the funding to pay for my, my salary, the contract, and I have money uh, for myself to buy equipment, to travel to conferences and um, in my specific way is uh, it's a global fellowship so that means um, that even though the contract is with uh, a French institution there is a partner institution McGill and they're sending me over here uh, to work in collaboration with McGill and then move back to France uh, to finish the project over there and this is basically, uh, I am the researcher. It is, as I said, an individual fellowship. So 
I am the only person hired by the project, paid uh, by the project. I am using sound morphing to study musical instrument timbre. And the project basically is uh, structured as an outgoing phase here at McGill. Um, it's three years. So the first year during the outgoing phase, I, am, I worked with uh, Professor Philippe de Pal. And then the second year, which is ending now in uh, September 2022, I work with uh, Stephen McAdams. And I am about to start the third year, the returning phase, where I go back to the beneficiary, uh, the PRISM lab in Marseille, to work with uh, Richard uh, Conlon Martinez's uh, team. So at Permit McGill, uh, the first year um, I worked with Philippe de Val on uh, sound modeling and transformation. The second year uh, with Stephen McAdams' uh, lab, I did musical instrument sound modeling and timbre perception. And then I am about to start the third year, which is supposed to be the creative exploration of musical instrument sound modeling. There was a pandemic in the middle of all of that. Uh, it affected the schedule quite a bit, but that was the original proposal, right? So three years, the proposed research was basically to use sound morphing to investigate timbre perception. The focus of the proposal is on musical instruments. And the entire idea um, for the project was to be able to create continuous timbre spaces and see if morphing is capable of breaking the categorical perception of musical instrument timbre. And I am going to talk a little about those two ideas here. So in order to explore those ideas, we need to understand what timbre spaces and musical instruments are. Um, once again, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, if you have any questions, just ask away. So musical instrument timbre, the word timbre refers to the ways in which sounds are perceived to differ. But it's the perceptual difference that cannot be accounted by pitch, loudness, spatial position, duration, and many other uh, characteristics of sound. Basically, what this means is if you're playing the same note, pitch, the same dynamics uh, in the same room with the same duration, and you can still perceive that those two different sounds, uh, that they are different, actually, for example, that they are played by different musical instruments, then uh, timbre is uh, uh, what we say is responsible for those differences. There is a categorical and a sensory view of timbre, and this is where it starts uh, to become interesting, at least in my opinion, right? So the categorical view uh, sees timbre or tries to investigate it and explain it from a, a sound source perspective. So now we're talking about recognizing the source of a sound, identifying the source of a sound, or even tracking the source of a sound in time. So that's basically uh, what allows us to recognize somebody's voice over the phone or a specific instrument in a, in a recording, or even uh, it's what allows us to hear when uh, in polyphonic music, when you have more than one instrument playing, uh, it's what allows us uh, to hear different instruments. Uh, they don't blend together into one thing, right? So we, we keep track of those uh, in time. However, the sensory view of timbre is connected to a multidimensional set of attributes associated with timbre spaces. And we're gonna delve into that uh, now because uh, this is more abstract, a more abstract idea. So musical instrument timbre, looking at it from the sensory view, um, we have to, uh, look at this picture here and try to understand what it shows, right? So this is a timbre space obtained with multidimensional scanning. 
MDS. What's happening here is basically um, we have three dimensions and each one of those little blocks here represents one musical instrument. So here, for example, we have S is string, FH is French horn, this is bassoon, um, trumpet, trombone, flute. So this representation here is, uh, if you want to understand the relationship between those sounds, basically sounds that are close together in this space are similar or considered similar, and sounds that are farther apart are more dissimilar than the ones that are close together. This is what the representation shows, right? So this space here, it's obtained by selecting sounds from different musical instruments. So here we have 16, like I said, oboe, uh, clarinet, uh, trumpet, trombone, flute. So you take sounds from different instruments, you present those sounds in pairs to listeners, you ask people to listen to each pair of those sounds and rate the similarity between those. So if they are identical, then the person moves the slider to identical. And if they are very different, the person moves the slider away from identical to different. And the idea is that each of those pairs will be similar or dissimilar in a different degree relative to the others. So the person listens to all of the pairs, rates all of those, and then you take those dissimilarities, put those in a matrix, and use the multidimensional scaling algorithm to find a spatial representation where the distances, the Euclidean distances between the points in that spatial representation will reflect as much as possible the perceptual dissimilarities. Is this clear? And I can't really see. Nobody says anything. Yes. Okay. Nice. So I looked at this and I told myself there are a few interesting uh, characteristics here. So, first of all, those timbre spaces are sparse. And uh, uh, what that means basically is this each musical instrument is, first of all, represented by one single note. So it's not a very complete representation of, of a musical instrument. It's just one recording of one note played by one person. But more importantly, each musical instrument uh, sound that was used in this space occupies a specific point in that space. And supposedly, it's, it's just void between musical instruments. So it's actually a very sparse representation of timbre, right? You can still understand uh, the relationships between the timbre of those sounds by looking at uh, you know, the ones that are close together, the ones that are far apart. You can even uh, see, for example, this dimension here. The, um, I took this figure from a, an article, from an old article from uh, 1977, I don't know why the reference doesn't appear here, but um, you can even try to, to interpret the dimensions of this space. So this specific space here, for example, the interpretation of the dimensions was this first dimension here uh, captures brightness. The second dimension here captures uh, spectral flux, and the third dimension captures onset asynchrony so uh, how the partials attack asynchronously so anyway um, this representation uh, very, it's very powerful um, very interesting but there are limitations you can't do much more with this and like i said uh, basically uh, it's mainly void it's mainly nothing with a few points actually representing some information there so my question for my project was basically, can we fill the gaps between musical instruments in those timbre spaces and create a sonic continuum? So my proposal was basically to use sound morphing 
to do that, to fill those gaps and investigate the relationship between the sensory and the categorical facets of amber perception. So the idea here is that sound morphing will alter both sensory and categorical perception of sounds. And hopefully I will uh, be able to uh, give you some examples of that, right? So um, I'll just skip ahead, talk a little about musical instrument timbre and sound morphing. So this is an example uh, of image morphing in that case, but it illustrates very well what we want to do when uh, we are morphing. So here we have uh, what we call a source and a target images. And uh, we have three intermediate images that are morphs. So the way um, we produce those intermediate images, I will talk about later. But basically, you can associate this uh, here, alpha, this is called the interpolation factor or the morphing factor. If you say that uh, alpha varies between zero and one, when alpha is zero, we are at the source, when alpha is one, we are at the target, and intermediate values of alpha would place us between the source and the target. For example, 0.25 closer to the source, 0.75 closer to the target. And this is the interesting point. Alpha 0.5, we should be exactly halfway between source and target. For this image, the example here, uh, I think this is uh, uncanny how uh, Alpha 0.5, it is uh, hard for me to decide if it's closer to the source or closer to the target. So I think this example of image morphing uh, successfully produces this intermediate image that is neither close to one nor to the other. It is really in between. So this example actually uh, illustrates how you can, if you know the the morphing procedure is successful, you can actually break the categorical perception of faces, right? So now you have a face that won't be associated with either the source or the target face. And what we want to do is the same, but for musical instruments. So I have an example here. This would be the source instrument. And the target. Now, a morph, uh, I'm not claiming that this is perceptually in the middle like that, but it was produced to be in the middle. So I want to tell you um, how to do it. And then uh, later, if we have time, I can tell you a little bit about the perceptual, we did some uh, perceptual experiments to see if it is perceptually in the middle, just like the face that I showed. So uh, the idea is you can use musical instrument sound working to investigate questions such as, is musical instrument sound perception categorical or continuous? In other words, can you go continuously from one instrument to the other um, without sudden jumps or discontinuities? And then, if it is possible, what kind of sound features should be manipulated to achieve this goal? And again, you know, if musical instrument sound perception or timbre perception in general is uh, continuous, then there is a musical instrument continuum. So that timbre space, um, we're, we're actually just sampling that timbre space with uh, those perceptual experiments. And if you manipulate those sounds correctly, then you can fill the space and explore the entire space. The area that used to be void is now also uh, it's game for uh, creative exploration and you know, music composition and many other possibilities, right? So before we talk about what sound morphing is and how to do it, I think we have to understand 
what wouldn't be sound water. So I have uh, some examples here, but the uh, interesting thing is, first of all, the image morphing example, it's a, a striking example of morphing, but it's not a good analogy because images don't have the temporal dimension. You would, uh, uh, a better analogy would be video morphing because now you also have a temporal dimension. We know that the, the morphed sound should be perceptually intermediate, but there is a specific way that it has to be done in order to actually be a morph. So the result must fuse into a single percept. What that means is basically um, it's not enough to just mix or crossfade sounds, right? So here I have an example of mixing that uh, was produced. It's actually one of the interest areas of the, of the reading group. It's uh, work that I did about uh, computer-aided orchestration. And the example I have here was produced with uh, an algorithm that I developed. Uh, basically, what you're going to hear is the target sound that was given to the orchestration algorithm, and then four, if I'm not mistaken, different orchestrations that uh, approximate perceptually the target that was given to the orchestration algorithm. And what's important to understand here is that the orchestrations are nothing more than a combination of different musical instrument sounds being played in unison or a mix of those musical instrument sounds. So before I move on, I need at least one uh, acknowledgement that this is clear. Good. Okay, so let's hear it. All right, so you can imagine doing something similar to try to create an intermediate version of two musical instrument sounds. Just play those together, align them very carefully, and uh, you know, hope for the best. But the thing is, uh, you can still hear, unless you do it really carefully and align the partials, just playing those together will usually result in uh, the perception that it's just two different sounds played together. And a morph has to be one single sound that has perceptual characteristics of the sound that you're using. There's another uh, interesting uh, thing about it is that the morph should be this one single entity that has intermediate features. So it's not enough if you want to create a morph. Let's go back to the image, uh, to the face morphing analogy. If you take the eyes from, uh, from Bush and the ears from Obama, and you know, if you take features from uh, one image or the other, what you will have in the end is definitely a hybrid image, but it's not a morph. If we go back here, the eyes are not from one or from the other. The eyes are actually an intermediate version of uh, like a, a, a mixture of the eyes and uh, everything else is the same, right? So the hair texture, the, the ear shape, the chin, everything. So this is what we want to do with sounds. Here I have an example of what morphing is not, how not to do it. So this is cross synthesis. Basically what happens is you take the spectral envelope from one sound and you apply it on a different sound. Let's hear it and then I'll, I'll tell you how I did it. So this is basically a clarinet sound and I applied the spectral envelope of a woman talking over a clarinet sound. That's why it sounds a little robotic because the clarinet was one single note so there are no frequency variations but you can still understand 
what the woman is saying. Well, you have to speak French, but anyway, you, you can still tell uh, that it is a person speaking, that it's this background. It's not what we want to do when we are more, right? All right, so how do you morph sounds? So basically, you apply the interpolation principle. So you have a source and a target sounds. You have to model those and Time permitting, I am uh, going to go into detail about that, how you model sounds. Then once you have the model, you have to establish correspondence between elements of the model. So going back to the face morphing example, you would model those faces and then establish correspondence. What does that mean? Well, you, you correspond the eyes of uh, one image with the eyes of the other one. You have parameters that model the eyes like bushes and then Obamas, and you would have, in order to create intermediate eyes, you would have to combine the parameters that captured the eyes for one or the other. This is the idea. And you have to do that with sounds, right? So once you establish the correspondence, you basically interpolate the model parameters for those corresponding elements. And once you have the interpolated model parameters. Note here that you use the alpha the morphing factor to perform the interpolation. So you recreate the morph from this interpolated set of parameters. This is basically those are the steps, right? So because sounds have this temporal um, dimension, there are multiple possible transformations that can uh, happen along the temporal dimension. I have four examples here, and uh, I really like uh, three of those very much. So uh, I hope you enjoy listening to those. The first one is what I call the dynamic morph. And basically, the morphing factor varies between zero and one along the duration of the sounds. So this is the result. Oh, by the way, before I play it, I did not create this morph, right? So. Uh, I, I found this example, I, I really like it, and I use it uh, to illustrate the <laughs> Nothing um, stops us from actually playing around with how the morphing factor will vary in time. So it doesn't have to vary linearly from zero to one during the duration of the morph. What we can do is basically move it freely. So let's say we vary it from zero to one and then back to zero during a uh, as the sound unfolds, and this is what we're gonna hear. Um, those are very interesting, um, and I think creatively, we can all start thinking about how we would uh, uh, use those in different, uh, like in composition, or I don't know, there are possible I think a myriad possible uh, creative applications of those. But those are not very challenging because of a few technical reasons. Technically, the most challenging type of morph is what I'm calling here the static morph. Because for the static morph, the morphing factor doesn't vary in time. You set the morphing factor. Here, it's uh, at 0.5. It's actually the same example we heard before. But what's challenging about it is now every single aspect of the sound has to be uh, intermediate. So uh, here, uh, it's 0.5, the morphing factor. And that means that the attack time, for example, has to be halfway between the attack time of the source and the target sound that was used. And every other feature of the sound has to be halfway. Um, this uh, is the same example. I'm just going to play it again. So um, I can go back and uh, later and play that example again. 
but I chose uh, this specific uh, example here to illustrate it because the um, one of the sounds has tremolo, has amplitude modulation, and the other one doesn't. So the morph would have to be uh, amplitude modulation, but not uh, as much as the source sound or target sound, like one of them, right? It would have to be halfway. Um, and again, we can go back and, and, and listen to it and decide if it is. But um, looking at the static morph, we can think about uh, another possibility, which is the cyclostationary morph, which basically um, is several static morphs uh, where you would have the target sound and then you would have one static morph uh, with a morphing factor that is just a little bit away from the target, let's say uh, 0.25, and then again, a static morph at 0.5, another one at 0.75, and finally, another one uh, at one. So you would have several versions of the, the source morphs and the target sound. Um, so the morph would uh, gradually move away from the source and closer to the target, as this example of cyclostationary morph that I created. This one is, uh, I created it myself, is from my, my PhD. Um, and what we have is nine intermediate versions. So I'm just going to play it. And uh, again, you can ask me questions now or later. Moving on, right? So here the idea, the idea of the project using those ideas. So I'm, as I mentioned before, focusing on musical instrument sounds and on timbre. So my idea is to use uh, morphed musical instrument sounds to try to create more musical instrument sounds that are perceptually intermediate. So we have it's a static morph. We have to morph the spectral, the temporal, and the spectral temporal intermediate sounds. This uh, image here sort of illustrates. Um, Could I ask a idea. question? Yes, please. Um, is it possible? I think um, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but in the previous sound morphs, were you always taking a linear path between two sounds? Like you have two elements in the sound space or the, the timbre space and you just went the Euclidean distance between them or the, the I, not the Euclidean distance, but you went the path along that? Right, except so, for, except yeah, for the sorry, sorry, go station. On. Well, um, I guess uh, my question was essentially, can, if you had these two points, instead of taking a linear space or a linear path, could you sort of go more around or take any sort of arbitrary path? It seemed, uh, I think if I'm understanding the cyclostationary correct, you kind of went along it and then along it and then along it and then along it, uh, but you couldn't, and I think that was maybe a guitar single string to a, a tuba or a brass, but you couldn't go maybe um, guitar over to violin over to tuba, or could you, or? Yeah. Uh, you that is, uh, it's a great question because it, uh, it has many questions in, in your question. And at the same time, it, it, it really captures the idea, right? So I want to try and break down your question into a few of those that I think are um, the, the questions that I am actually trying to, uh, to answer in, my, in my, my project here. So first of all, the morphs, uh, you are talking about linear uh, uh, paths um, 
but the morphs are not done in the timbre space. This is something that is very important. So I'm even going to go back here. So this timbre space and every other timbre space that we obtain with the uh, similarity of um, musical instrument sounds, we don't know how. Let's suppose that we choose a point in this space here, this point between C2 and O1. We don't know how to synthesize a sound that corresponds to this specific point. And this is the entire idea of using sound morphing, right? Because the way we morph sounds, we don't just uh, choose a point in this space and synthesize a sound because nobody knows how to do that. What you have to do is the other way around. You have to uh, synthesize a sound and see where this sound, uh, what the position of this sound would be in this specific number space. Is that is that clear? I, th I think so. Yeah. So this is this is something that is very challenging uh, for the link between perception and um, the, the models that we have for sound, right? So moving on, it's still the same question that you have, but um, now it's a less technical. In order to do that, um, the best way to, uh, to do what you were trying to achieve, instead of going from, it was a harps chord, but it could be uh, a plucked guitar sound, right? It doesn't really matter. It was a plucked string. So in order to, instead of going from there straight to the tuba sound, if you want to go uh, harps chord and then, I don't know, clarinet and then tuba, you can do that. All you have to do is add a clarinet sound to this board and then say, uh, don't go between the straight line that connects uh, harps chord and tuba. Go harps chord clarinet, so you morph harps chord with the clarinet, and then you morph the clarinet with the tuba. And then you would go from a harps chord to tuba via the clarinet sound. But you have to have the clarinet sound in that. And you can even imagine, for example, instead of connecting two sounds, you can imagine connecting those three and now you are creating a region in the space that is a triangle. And then using those three sounds, you would interpolate those and you could move around the triangular area that is delimited by those uh, three sounds. So it takes a little geometrical uh, imagination, but two points determine a straight line. And I'm talking about interpolation here, but the obvious question is, can you also extrapolate? In principle, you can. I don't know how good the extrapolation would be. The interpolation, we know very well um, what we expect. The extrapolation, I don't really know if it would correspond to. That is actually a research question, the extrapolation. And also, uh, you don't need to, to use two sounds. You can use as many sounds as you want. With the obvious caveat, that if you use 14 sounds, then who can tell the contribution of each one of those, right? So uh, when we have only two sounds, it's easier to keep track of what comes from where when you start adding other sounds to the mix. And again, the path doesn't have to be only this. You can definitely say, uh, I want to go from this string to the flute and then to this string and then back to the first one. So you can do all of those things. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I also think you might start getting into it, but it seemed to be a lot of it would be due to the inherent models of the sound and synthesis uh, sort of paradigms you're, you're using. Um, but I don't want to derail you too much because I think no, you... no, 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 it's it's good, it's good. I'd rather uh, we 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 hit um, forty minutes already, so I suppose uh, I suppose this is uh, you know discussion time. I will use the slides here 
to explain those things. So I could uh, I could take your question or anybody else's question um, about how to do it, about any anything else. So just escalate. That's basically. Um, well, yeah, a large amount of. Um, well, I was just trying to kind of picture, uh, I think it's the next slide where you had the different transformations. Um, yeah, the court, yeah, the correspondence one, or kind of the, the, the underlying, yeah, okay, so you have a model. Um, and then you have the source and the target. But okay, so these, this S hat and T hat, um, I guess would presumably they would be like a, a vector in the parameter space for the inherent model you're using? Exactly. exactly. Okay. And then, but then that is divorced. I mean, the, the end resulting sound is somewhat, is, uh, these don't necessarily directly map two paths within the timbre space uh, directly because it's perceptual, but the inherent underlying model and how the sound is generated once, I mean, that seems like it would have a large impact in terms of where it lies within the uh, timbre space, as well as the perceptual aspects of the transformation. That's the entire idea. That's the entire idea, right? So there is a implicit inherent, I don't even know uh, which word best captures, but there is a perceptual relationship between what we represent with the model and how uh, the sound is perceived. And um, the entire idea is how do we manipulate the model in um, a way that we understand the perceptual impact of the manipulation that we did. So this is, this is the, the challenge here, right? Um, I'll just go on, right? So, uh, I've been developing this, the sound morphing toolbox, and um, I'll play a few uh, um, examples here, and I'm not going to really uh, show uh, all the details, but hopefully it will clarify some of those questions, right? So basically the sound morphing toolbox is algorithms that I developed to, to, to morph sounds. Uh, this is not updated now. Uh, you know, I've been working on this for the past two years now, but uh, um, this will hopefully uh, illustrate what we're talking about. So the first thing that we're going to uh, see is how to time scale sounds and understand why. And then I'm just going to show the sinusoidal model. And this is what uh, Graham was, uh, was mentioning. So this is how we represent the sound. And finally, the morphing algorithm using uh, the sign of the model. So, time scaling. The first thing we have to do is for the correspondence thing, right? So, if one sound is longer than the other, then we need to interpolate the duration of the sounds. Let's say one sound lasts one second, the other one lasts two seconds. Then, if we want a morph that is in the middle, exactly halfway, it couldn't be one or two seconds. It has to be, or any other, right? So it has to be 1.5 seconds. And uh, that perceptually, um, the, we are assuming that perceived duration is linear in this case. So all we do here is, this is the example. I have a auto flip sound. So time scaling basically uh, makes the sound either longer or shorter. So here I have examples with very extreme uh, scales. So half the duration and twice the duration. All right, so um, we can manipulate the duration of sounds. And uh, in my opinion, it's a good quality both. The time scales for the morphs, uh, they will probably not be uh, as extreme as that. So the sinusoidal model, and this is um, this is how we are representing the sounds for the, the, the morphs, the examples that I have here in this. 
So the sinusoidal model basically tries to represent the oscillatory modes of musical instruments with time varying sinusoids. Right, so uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go on. Those here are the steps. Those are just signal processing steps, right? So you start with the short time Fourier transform, extract the magnitude and the phase, and then you will, from the magnitude spectrum, you will uh, estimate the peaks in the spectrum because the peaks in the spectrum correspond to the partials, and you will estimate the frequency and the amplitudes of those partials, of uh, the sinusoids that you will represent the sound with. Then, um, in time, you will connect those peaks uh, as partials and select only the harmonic part. Uh, you also need phase information. This is um, just an illustration of how it works, right? So uh, one original sound. Now, this is the spectrogram of this original sound. And everybody here, I expect, um, if not, please just uh, tell me so, right? So everybody is familiar with the spectrogram, so we understand that this here is the partial, the fundamental frequency. And then we have, for this specific case, uh, harmonics, right? So the first, the second, the third harmonic. This is the information we want to extract from that sound. We want, uh, in the end, to have a straight line where this frequency is to be the fundamental frequency and so on. So how do we do that? We look at the magnitude spectrogram. Each one of those peaks corresponds to one uh, of those partials. So we want to find those peaks, select those. And what that corresponds to is looking at the spectrogram, the dots represent the spectral peaks, right? So once we have those spectral peaks, we want to isolate those, estimate the amplitudes and the frequencies of those. And once you have that, you already represented uh, the sound uh, only using the spectral peaks, but still they are not connected in time. So um, you need to connect those in time, right? So this is, uh, we're going to listen now to uh, the representation of that sound using only sinusoids. It sounds very close. The residual is basically everything that was not modeled as sinusoids. Let's listen to that. It's very, um, very soft, so I normalize the residual so we can really hear what is not captured, not modeled as sinusoids. All right, so uh, as we see here, the black waveform is the residual. It's very little information that is, that is missed. Now, this is the peak continuation, the partial tracking thing that I told you about. We have several problems. Uh, we want those to be straight lines. So we, we need to clean the representation. There's a partial tracking algorithm that does that. Now the representation is clean. We have the fundamental and only the harmonics uh, that are of interest. Once you have that representation, we already removed more information. So let's listen to only the harmonic representing that sound. It's still close. You can uh, already hear the, uh, there's a little information missing. The information that is missing is here. So anyway, this is technical details. I'm going to skip all of those technical details here. What really matters is if we have the accordion and the flute sound, this is how we represent the accordion and the flute sound with sinusoids. And now what we have to do is correspondence, right? As I said, you model the sounds, you establish correspondence. So you take the fundamental frequency of the accordion and you match with the fundamental frequency of the flute and so on. First harmonic with first harmonic, second harmonic. And now you are interpolating the amplitudes and the frequencies of those sinusoids. And you're going to have this. This is the interpolated amplitudes and frequencies of those two sounds. Once you have that, you resynthesize it to obtain this waveform that um, 
visually, the waveform is definitely uh, between those two, and also the spectrogram here, it is uh, an intermediate between those. And I can finally play those uh, steps. So the original accordion, original flute, time scaled version, so they are exactly the same duration. And only the harmonics for each one of those. And then finally, the morph, the combination of the harmonics. And I suppose this is it. I am uh, already, I'm going to stop right here. I, I don't have uh, anything else to say, any questions that you might have now is the time to ask your questions. I can't hear you, you're muted. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Marcelo, for your great presentation. Uh, we are now in the QA session, so please um, feel free to just unmute yourself. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, the project looks really cool. The results were really cool to see. Um, something I found interesting in the last example was that the, the source and target sounds, they sounded significantly lower in pitch than the morph sound, at least to me. Is, is that true? And if so, why was it like that? Is a very good catch. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, when we talk about timbre, that the sounds have to be equalized in pitch, loudness, in every other perceptual feature uh, except uh, you know the, the ones that are not mentioned there, basically. So except the 